American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Throw it all away. Welcome to another episode of. American Timelines. I'm Amy, and that's Joe. And this is a very special episode. No, it's not a of very special. With Mr. Cooper. No, this is American Timelines, and it's not a special a episode. History for jerks. This is episode one ninety something. Oh my god! Did you know that? One ninety something. This is. This is. Um, that's crazy. One ninety seven. No. Oh. I thought we already did 198, though. All right. Who cares? Anyway, this is 197. This is episode 197 of American Timelines. We're almost at 200. We're going to hit that mark pretty soon. What are we going to do for 200? We should do it on shrooms. Oh, I was thinking we should do it nude. I think we should shroom a live nude podcast. A live nude show on shrooms. I don't Nobody think has nude. to know we're nude. I don't think we have to be nude. I think just on shrooms would be good. I'll be nude and you'll be on shrooms. I want to see you on shrooms. No, no. You're on shrooms and I'll be nude. I don't think. I've done shrooms twice and nothing happened. It was just like... You didn't have right, good ones. I They tasted like feces. I no, I can fe- make it so it don't taste like anything. How do you make it? You can't just make it. Make it a tea. Where make do it you in get the shrooms from? That's my personal information. Yes. And I like the plausible deniability of you not telling me yeah. any of this stuff. In fact, I prefer you just drug me and not tell me. Oh, I should. All right, um, n- moving on. Move. We are in 1957. <laughs> yes, we're in September. talking about September and October. And October of 1957. Thank yes. you to those who have been with us all along. I can't imagine there's many of you left, but there are people listening, and we're also approaching, I don't know if you know this, we're, we're hmm. approaching 200 episodes. We're approaching 50,000 down- downloads. Nice. Yeah. Most of them were in the... One up, listen to one, and then to well, fuck for, this. 40, <laughs> Turned it off. Forty eight thousand are just me downloading it myself. Yeah, like, probably. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why you're listening, and I don't care why you're listening. But thank you for listening. You keep us going. You, the listener. Well, and today I have a very twisty, turny tale that I had never heard of. Really? So it was. It was kind of fun to research because I was like, "Wow, this is." This oh. is uh, well. I'm excited to hear you tell story. it. Hopefully, you'll tell it with some oomph. I'll try. Well, we'll see. I don't. I might I, fall asleep. Well, I don't have a whole lot of stuff. I mean, I have a lot of stuff, but nothing. It, I don't think I went into depth on much because. All right, let's move I on. I actually have no memory of doing any research, so who knows what's going to happen? All right, let's start with September 1st of 1957, shall we? All right. Do you remember me ever mentioning a rock star by the name of Elvis Presley? Yes. Ever hear of him? Mm-hmm. Well. On September 1st, 1957, he asked his audience at a Seattle concert to please rise for the national anthem. Uh-huh. He picked up his guitar, leaned in, shook his hips, and began singing, You ain't nothing but a hound dog. And the crowd went wild. He didn't even sing the national anthem. He faked them out. Oh, so he told him to stand up, sing for the national anthem, and then he started playing hound dog? Yes. Oh. And I'm not sure why I know that or why I have that on my notes. Oh, well, it was a big switcheroo on I, him. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, he switched roo. I tried to find a recording of it and I failed. I, did I wonder find if people sat down when they realized it wasn't the. No, they thing. went nuts because that was the biggest song ever. And oh, they were so excited. They were, they were at an Elvis concert. So. Oh, so it was like kids and yeah, stuff. It no, wasn't, you're not going to. Yeah. You're at a concert in yeah. Seattle. You're not going to be like, oh, no, that wasn't the National Anthem. I'm sitting down. I know, that's true. And uh, so. Uh, and now we got some sad stuff oh, to talk about. Oh, boy. Some, like, downer news, uh, because we're still in 1957. We're still... Oh, boy. The civil rights movement yeah. hasn't even begun yet, so it's a lot yeah. of anger and hatred. So, uh, uh, Unlike now. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a lot more. Um, yeah. A national, the, according to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, on September 4th, 1957, Governor... The governor of Arkansas, Governor Orville Faubus, Mm -hmm. called out the National Guard 
to prevent nine black students from entering Little Rock Central High School. He didn't want them, even though... Uh, the law the, said that yeah. they... Brown versus Board of Education was 1954, mm-hmm. three years ago. Uh, and this was the, you know, supposed to be the end of segregation, but... What uh, um the gears of change grind slowly, my friend. So did they go? The National Guard go? So in September, yeah, on September fourth, the guard came to stop them. Uh, nineteen, these nine teens would become symbols, much like the landmark decision we know is Brown versus Board. Um, the Little Rock Nine is the nineteen. Yes, came to be you know everybody knows that. Uh, they were to be the first African American students to enter Little Rock Central High School. Three years earlier, following the Supreme Court ruling, the Little Rock School Board pledged to voluntarily de- desegregated schools. Mm. But this idea is, was explosive for the community. And like much of the South, it was fraught with anger and bitterness and everybody's all upset. Um, and so h- here we are on September uh, on September 2nd, I guess, which was the night prior to their first day was supposed to be September 3rd. So on September 2nd, the night prior to the first day, mm-hmm. Uh, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus ordered the state's National Guard to block their entrance, and he said it was for the safety of the students. Mm-hmm. And then on September 4th, just 24 hours after the judge ordered the the Little Rock Nine, the judge ordered the Little Rock Nine to be attending Central High immediately, a belligerent mob, along with the National Guard, again prevented the teens from entering the school on the 4th. Uh, so two day, first two days, they're just prevented by mm-hmm. uh, an angry mob and a National Guard. And there's more on that to come. But sprinkled in here on September 5th of 1957, On the Road by Jack Kerouac was published by Viking Press in New York. Yes. Just kind of gives you a little perspective of what's happening in the world. Right. Like that's, this is the time we're living in. Mm-hmm. September 6th, Elvis recorded White Christmas, Silent Night, and Here Comes Santa Claus, just a few days after his national anthem thing. And then on September 9th, 1957, Nashville... Let's jump over to Nashville, which has its own issues with desegregation. They have a new elementary school called the Hattie Cotton Elementary School at this time. Mm -hmm. And it was dynamited. Oh, no. Uh, Hattie Cotton became... With kids in it? Well, no. But Hattie Cotton became an integrated school in 1957, following the Brown v. Board thing. uh, Which set in motion the integration of American schools after a court order in January... Nashville adopted what became known as the Nashville Plan in the fall. The plan was to begin with integration at six city elementary schools, Bailey, Buena Vista, Fair, Glen, Hattie Cotton, and Jones. Uh, And they were to integrate one grade level per year is what they were going to do. That process was to begin September 9th, 1957, when 19 black six-year-olds attempted to attend the first day of school. Four were denied for administrative reasons, whatever those were. Yeah, whatever they could make up and plot I mean, their we're asshole. About six year olds here, people. Oh my god. god. So Hattie Cotton admitted one black student, a six year old black girl. And following the first day of school, dynamite exploded just after midnight, early on September tenth, nineteen fifty seven, rocking the neighborhood. The school reopened nine days later and repairs followed in nineteen fifty eight. So in the early nineties 1990s, the original building was torn down and construction of a new building began. Wait, wait, nobody cares about that. I don't know why that's in there. Um, But the 1957 bombing uh, tore down walls, knocked out every window in the modern one-story structure, and caused at least $71,000 in damage, which is equivalent to $531,000 today. Mm -hmm. Uh, It damaged the library, the classrooms, interior walls, and lockers. The attack triggered a response from local civic leaders and members of the Nashville student movement. Nashville Police Chief Douglas E. Haas said that the incident has gone beyond a matter of integration. These people have ignored the laws and they have shown no regard for you, meaning whites, or any citizen. Uh, These people meaning the segregationists. Uh, So Reverend Kelly Miller-Smith and Reverend Will Campbell held a community meeting that showed Quote, the bombing had touched off all the stored up rage in the black community. Speaker after speaker got up and denounced the bombing and demanded some kind of reprisal. There was talk of guns and retaliation for most of the evening. Smith let the meeting go on without challenging the speakers. It was as if if he knew they had to just let their rage vent itself. Uh, And then Smith eventually spoke. He said, we can go forward as planned and try to show them the right way. Hattie Cotton reopened nine days later without the six-year-old girl whose mother transferred her to the all-black head elementary school in North Nashville. 
Despite several weeks of investigation uh, and a cash reward for information and the detaining of at least six suspects, no one was ever charged in the school bombing. Nationally known segregationist John Casper was questioned but never charged. He was described by police as playing a role in securing a cache of dynamite two days before the bombing in Hattie Cotton. So, uh, but later, Casper was convicted in November 1958, but f- not for this, but for inciting a riot on the first day of school in Nashville in 1958. So that guy, remember we've talked about that guy mm-hmm. before, John Casper. I think you even mentioned him once. Yeah. Just a racist piece of shit Ugh. asshole garbage yeah People. so it didn't go easy yeah it's, you know god yeah that's our those poor children parents. those poor little kids six-year-olds come on those poor kids don't i mean i just don't have any idea what's going on you know no and they're people like i don't that's what i don't understand you know well, well they just get so dehumanized in on purpose like They've been dehumanized over years and years and years. And it's people that don't have any exposure. Yep. Or or they don't, I don't know. Like, I think of my students and my students of color. Yeah. And I love them, like, my like almost like they're my own children. I feel like you love them more than your own children. Oh, my God. That's a horrible thing to say. Our poor kids. <laughs> no. no, I'm just kidding. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, our kids are older, gangly, and weird now. <laughs> yeah, these kids are like these kids kindergarten are and like your kids are adorable grade. and they hug you all day long. And you, they do. They you, pile on me you, all day. You hug them. And yeah, which is probably not sweet kids. But anyway, but it's just it's like they're they're I don't I don't know I just I don't understand how well, people can look you, at these little children can't, and can't fathom it because I I can fathom it I can, I mean, can fathom it yes I can fathom it. It's good that you can't... I just complain about it because... Yeah, make yourself do it. White people are so awful <laughs> a lot of the time, <laughs> it seems like. Yeah, we're talking to you, white person who's listening to this in your Prius. Yeah, really? Just kidding. You're not bad. No. Just others are. No. And we got just a long way to go. Ones. We got a long way to... Yeah, talking racist, racist ones. We're talking about you racist people We have to be sad to about that. That's true. We don't have to apologize. Oh, to the racist, but hopefully racist. I, I'm pretty sure racist, racist wouldn't listen to this. Would have turned this off a while ago. I think so. I think <laughs> you're like, probably right on guys. with that. And they're probably bombing our mailbox soon. Mm-hmm. September 9th, 1957, President Eisenhower. Eisenhower I said Eisenhower. President Eisenhower. Signed, <laughs> have another one. I need to have a beer. That reminds me. I need a beer. He signed the first civil rights bill since Reconstruction. Eisenhower was such a good president. Yeah, I think he was. I think if he wasn't president at this time. Yeah. We wouldn't be as far as we are with civil yeah. rights, yeah. sadly. Yeah, I think so. Because um, you think of the 50s so backwards, but he really did a lot of this. So. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then we have a cool birthday. I've got a birthday. Oh, boy. And you're going to be mad and happy about this birthday. Oh, okay. So two reasons, two things. Uh, number one, mm-hmm. uh, it's a wrestler God is born. It. So kick it. Hit the music. Uh, but but this also is tied to an advertisement. We got an advertisement based on this birthday. So you can play uh, it? yeah, I'm okay. gonna I'm going to well it's it's a post read advertisement, so I'm gonna read it. Oh. Uh, so let's first tell you who was born and then I'll get an advertisement. Born in Rome, Georgia, uh pro wrestler, American wrestler, and Charlotte native, Charlottean, current mm-hmm. Charlottean. Arn Anderson from okay. the Four Horsemen was born. All right, and you ask your you may and ask I, yourself. I care about this why because <laughs> he's one of the Four Horsemen, baby. Arn Anderson, he's the he's the he's the enforcer. No, I still don't care. He's a badass. So I really, don't here's care. why you really care because we have a friend, mm-hmm. a colleague, a friend of ours from college, House of Fun regular, uh, hung out at our college house, uh, who is now an author, and he. Makes he creates graphic novels, and he's got this new weird niche in graphic novels. Niche, where, niche, 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 niche. Oh, a niche is something that's niche, but this is a niche, right? I don't think. I think you say niche if you have a niche. Can't you say that? I don't know words. It's starting to sound like does. a racial slur. The more you say it, so we better stop. It's definitely not a racial slur. This guy's name is Dirk Manning, and he's a friend of ours, and he. Makes graphic novels, and he now writes 
wrestler biographies as graphic novels. Uh, this is his second one. His first was Tony Schiavone's. And now this just got through the, it, it's on pre-order. It's called Arn Anderson, My Life is the Enforcer, created by Dirk Manning. It's a graphic novel memoir co-written by Arn Anderson in The Enforcer, co-written by Arn Anderson, de- detailing his life leading to and then forever changing professional wrestling. He was a big deal. So there was a Kickstarter campaign, and it was successful, and it is now on sale, and you can buy it, and there's a link to wherever you're listening to this podcast. Look in the description, and you can click that link. So you can now pre-order Dirk Manning's book, which is co-written by Arn Anderson, The Enforcer, detailing his life, leading to, and then forever changing professional wrestling. See, this kind of thing is for me, because I love biographies, I love wrestling, and I like graphic novels. I hate just reading a book because I just something about the words on the page make me fall asleep. I'll listen to a book all day long in my car. I'll listen to a whole book cover to cover. See, my I don't have the attention span to listen because to something real long. Like because my my ADD, it's like I for, I tune it out too much. See, I have a different form of ADD. I can't sit and read a book, hmm. but I can listen to it all day long while I'm writing so anyway but this is even better because i can look at comic books and they're really cool drawings of arn anderson i don't does it say who hopefully it says who drew the pictures because dirk writes dirk manning is awesome he's a friend of ours we went to college with him we knew him as dark man because the guy wore all black all the time with a black hat backwards he was kind of like a mix between jay and silent bob uh but in all black but way smarter than everybody uh i don't think he I don't think he really smoked at all, he, but he was just a cool, smart dude that hung out with us, and we all call him Dark Man, and that's where I think he got the name Dirk Manning. Yeah. Dark Man, Dirk right. Manning. Anyway, he's a great guy. It's I'm so excited that he does this. He's got a bunch of graphic novels that you can purchase online, too, so I would say don't just stick with it. He's got horror graphic novels. He's got a whole horror genre of stuff that he writes that are really cool. Um, and they're just really well done, and he's a genius. And Arn Anderson is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and I'm jealous that he gets to work with Arn Anderson. He met Tony Schiavone. I bumped into Tony Schiavone at a podcast festival once, and I said, hey, you you worked with my friend. He's like, who's your friend? I was like, Dirk Manning. He's a buddy of mine. He's like, oh, he is? Oh, my God, what's your name? And they talked to me. Oh, so nice. Dirk Manning gave me street cred with wrestlers at a podcast mm. festival. Anyway, so check out Arn Anderson, My Life is the Enforcer. The link will be in our show description uh, but you can go to Arn Anderson, My Life is the Enforcer, backerkit.com uh, to get your pre order. Uh, but again, the link will be in the description. And thanks, Dirk Manning, uh, for supporting American Timelines. Yep. And thanks, Arn Anderson, for being born in 1957, which gave us the segue to bring this up. Yeah, that's and pretty so, sweet. Yeah, how about that? Arn Anderson was born right here in 1957 in our timeline. He lives in Charlotte. I think I've seen him around town. And so there you go. Swing. Check out that book, man. September 21st, 1957. Moving on. Yeah. The Perry Mason TV series based on the character by author Earl Stanley Gardner. Yep. Starring Raymond Burr premieres on CBS TV. Did you know that was based on an, uh, a book? Perry Mason? I did not know that. Did you know that our old dog Floyd, his original name was Perry Mason? I did. I did know that. That's stupid. That's a stupid name for a dog. No offense to Tina Teague who named him. Uh, and yeah, I, offense to her. Actually. Okay, offense to her. You should never name a dog Perry No, Mason. because you shouldn't give your dog away because your boyfriend doesn't like dogs. Your Boom. dog came first. Boom. Hopefully she doesn't hear this. She's not listening. Yeah, she's break. not listening to this. Anyway, September 23rd, 1957. We're going to jump right there to a new, uh, a new number one song in the U.S. I know we haven't been talking about these, but this is a big one by Buddy Holly and the Crickets. You want to guess what song? Oh, God. Peggy Sue? Nope. Darn that'll it. be the day. Oh, then you say goodbye. Yes, that'll be the day when you make me cry. I know that one. That'll be the day. You say you're going to leave. I know it's a lie because that'll be the day when I die. See, that's you can sing anything. No. I think not. you could. You could You could make that. You could take that and redo it right now, no. and it would be a number one hit. No, that was. It'd be a number one hit on, All right, moving on. on Billboard chart. Baby. Mm, moving on. All right. That same day that That'll Be the Day by Buddy Holly and the Crickets reached number one in the U.S., mm-hmm. President Dwight D. Eisenhower orders U.S. troops to support integration of nine black students at Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. So he sent troops to counterbalance the Good. guard to say, no, you those kids are going and you're going to fucking protect those motherfucking 
kids. Good. Motherfucker. Eisenhower's awesome. You're going to stop those motherfucking people from motherfucking stopping stuff. Uh, and this was 16 days after the Little Rock incident. A federal judge ordered the National Guard removed, and once again on September 23rd, the Little Rock Nine attempted to enter the school, though escorted by Little Rock police into a side door. Another angry crowd gathered and tried to rush into Central High, fearing for the lives of the nine students. School officials sent the teens home. They did, however, manage to attend class for about three hours that day, God. and that's why Eisenhower sent U.S. troops. Yeah. Uh, after that happened. September 24th, 1957, Jailhouse Rock was released by Elvis. That was a classic. Became the Billboard Song of the Year. Uh, September 25th, 300 U.S. Army troops guard nine black children uh, t- to Central High School in Arkansas. The, the troops arrived, and 300 of them helped the kids go. Um, uh, and that was... Uh, it was following... Eisenhower did this following a plea from Little Rock's mayor, Woodrow Mann. Mm. Uh, and he sent those U.S. troops to the scene to help, personally guarded by soldiers from the National Guard soldiers and the Army's 101st Airborne. 101st Airborne, yes. The Little Rock Nine began regular class attendance at Central High. And isn't that fucking sad? That yes. They had to have the Army help mm. them go to fucking school. That the National Guard was even against. Because of bigoted idiots i know scum of the earth and that's what it's like the ones who are fighting everything today it's like you're gonna be those those people, people. that's who you it's, are it's the same thing it's the same all the shit. maga it's all yeah, that's those MAGA. those that's are who the, you are maga yeah that's what they want a, a, that's great again to them yeah uh, that i just pictured that picture of that white lady screaming behind that <clears throat> um black teenage yeah girl you yeah. know that picture just i'm talking that, about yeah like that, that i picture that woman mm-hmm. yeah her and that that bitch that got Emmett Till killed. Um, yeah, those two fucking faces of awful. That's who this Mag- that's MAGA. Okay, absolutely. October first, nineteen fifty-seven, uh, the first appearance of "In God We Trust" on U.S. paper currency. Oh, yep. See, people think it always was there. Nope, it wasn't until fifty-seven that they added that. Shit. I wonder why. So people saying. Oh, they founded everything on moment. God. You know, it wasn't founded. It was founded on no. separation of church they and state. They added all that shit God in the was 50s. Later. In the 50s, all this crazy scare and racism. Those are the people that added this, I think. I don't know. They're, I can see both ways. I mean, I think it's... Because it's, it's on police cars and stuff, too. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. I, I, I think I'd be okay like, with it if it wasn't just like... If it didn't specifically mean one particular Christian, God. yeah. What about people that believe in multiple gods right like, okay or a different type of god or i don't know I, I'm, I'm very dumb about religion because i think yeah. it's all crap so i don't really know mythos yeah it's mythos it's myth the word myth is in it it's all mm-hmm. myth uh maybe maybe it is maybe god is real and i'm just a dumbass but um and that's fine nobody's listening to me like no, nobody's taking me as gospel i'm a some jackass making a podcast Okay, October 2nd, 1957, <laughs> The Bridge on the River Kwai. Yes. Directed by David Lean and starring William Holden and Alec Guinness is released. I've never seen that, did you? Yeah, it became the Academy Awards Best Picture of 1958. Yeah, I'm in my watching of all the Oscars. Best Pictures, yeah. and I've watched that one. Uh, is it good? Boring as hell to me, yeah. but I, it's it's also not 1958 anymore, so yeah. we've had so many other things since. So I was, I didn't care for it, but I don't think it's... I don't think I'm their target audience. Right, right. I don't think a uh, uh, 45 year old in 2022 is their target audience. Uh, but it was an epic war film. I'm not a big war film guy either. Mm. It's an epic war film, war film directed by David Lee and based on the 1952 novel written by Pierre Bouillet. Bouillet. Although mm-hmm. the film uses the historical setting of the construction of the Burma Railway in 1942 to 1943, the plot and characters of Bouillet's novel. I don't know if that's how you say Bouye. It's B-O-U-L-L-E. Is that Bouye? Bouye. Bouye. That's what I uh, was saying. And the screenplay are most entirely fictional. The cast includes William Holden, Alec Guinness, Jack Hawkins, and Sesu Hayakawa. Definitely nailed that one. Yeah. <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> uh, yep, it is now widely recognized as one of the greatest films ever made. It was the highest grossing film of 57 and receives overwhelmingly positive reviews 
from critics. I don't remember much of it. I, I think I was I slept through most of it. It was so boring to me. But all right, well, let's move on. I'm sorry, I'm bored by that. That's yeah. I'm the one of the best movies I ever made, and it puts me to sleep. October second, 1957, the New York Yankees appear in the 25th Baseball World Series yes. and beat the Milwaukee Braves three to one in Game One at Yankee Stadium. They ended up losing the series four to three, though. Yeah. And October 3rd, 1957, Allen Ginsberg's Howl and Other Poems is Ruled Not Obscene. I've never read that. Remember, we talked about it a couple of times. That yeah. Us, had some controversy. I I read, I started reading it just to see if I thought it was obscene. It, there's a lot, there's some sex in it. I think that's why they. Sex. And some, I think there's some, I think there might be some homosexual sex, too. I think that that's might be why everybody was upset. Oh. In the 50s. In the like, 50s, yeah. I think. Don't quote me on that because. I have a shitty memory. I drink a lot of cold beers, delicious <laughs> cold beers. And then October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik 1, the yes. f- first artificial Earth the satellite. space race begins. Yep. First satellite into elliptical low Earth orbit. It's their first first official satellite. Um, a little space race begins. It sent a radio signal back to Earth for three weeks before it's three... Silver zinc batteries ran out. Oh, wait. So three weeks. They <laughs> put up yeah. space for three weeks. And it continued in orbit for three months until aerodynamic drag caused it to fall back into the atmosphere on January 4th of 1958. Mm. Do you want to know anything more about this satellite? Like, do you want to know the details of, like, what it looked like? No. And the, anything else? Not really. Tracking it and Not really. Sputnik. But the ionosphere, do you want to, like... Go into the no, deep, deep I things definitely about the don't ionosphere wanna, and how it works. I definitely don't want to do how that. How orbiting Earth works. Like I don't get I don't that. get it. I don't either. I'm not smart enough to get it. And then, okay, on October 4th, 1957, that same day, yeah. the TV sitcom Leave It to Beaver debuted oh, on CBS. I used to watch that all the time. You did? Ori- yeah. Original titles included Latch It to Snatch, Puff It for Muff, or Serve It to Furburger. Stop it. That is such a bunch of but they went lies. With, they went with Leave It to Beaver. <laughs> you are ridiculous. Serve it to Furburger. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Larry. We're going with Leave It to Beaver. Oh, come on. I already got my <laughs> I already got my Serve It to Furburger <laughs> T-shirt made. Oh my god. Uh, October that same day on October fourth was an, another birthday, and this one's not tied to an ad, but a is great, it a wrestler? Nope. Okay, good. But this guy was born in the Hollis neighborhood of New York City's Queensboro on October 4th, 1957. His father was a public school administrator, and his mother was a park administrator for the New York City Parks and Rec Department. His brothers are painter Daniel Simmons Jr. and Joseph Simmons, better known as Rev Run. Oh, yeah. Of Run DMC. So who are we talking about? The other Run DMC guy. No. D. No. MC. That's Daryl McDaniel. He's not a Simmons. MC. No, that's Daryl McDaniel. Run. Joseph Simmons is DJ Run. Who's his brother? He's not in Run DMC. Oh, he's not in Run DMC? No, he formed Def Jam, though. You don't know this? In 1975, Ooh. after graduating from August Martin High School, uh, notable alumni include Ed Lover and Freedom Williams from, you know who Freedom Williams is? From CNC Music Factory, that guy. Okay. Anyway, Simmons briefly attended City College of New York in Harlem, where he met a young DJ B-boy Kurt Walker, a.k.a. Curtis Blow, who influenced him to participate in the hip-hop phenomenon. Upon hearing Eddie Chiba perform in Harlem in 77, Simmons knew that hip-hop would be his career. Simmons stated, hearing Chiba in 77 made me feel like I had just witnessed the invention of the wheel. Sweet. Russell Simmons. Oh, Russell Simmons. Russell Simmons. That's right. Yeah, the creator of Def Jam. Uh, Yeah, so there you go. All right. Russell Simmons, baby. And then one more birthday, and that's it for the birthdays, okay? Oh. Three is a, but this one you're going to love. This okay. one's your favorite. Oh. Okay? Born on October 5th. In fact, I'm surprised you don't know. Ryan Burkett. He was born on October 5th. Oh, ghost. guess who he shares a birthday with? Who? We're very excited about. Oh. Uh, avid listener, Ryan Burkett, and beautiful man. That's true. With and a beautiful uh, set of beautiful nips. Beautiful bod, too. Beautiful hairy nips. Yep. Oh, my God. He combs them, braids All them. All right. Anyway, October 5th, 1957, American comedian Bernard Jeffrey McCullough was born in Chicago, Illinois. Who? Bernard Jeffrey McCullough, born in Chicago, Illinois, the second child of Mary McCullough and Jeffrey Harrison. Bruce McCullough. Nope. 
Mm-hmm. Bernard Jeffrey McCullough was raised by a single mother and his grandparents on the city's south side. Bernard Jeffrey McCullough began his high school career at Chicago Vocational High School. His mother died in 1973 when he was 16. Shortly after, his older brother and his strange father both died. He later Batman. graduated from Chicago Vocational High School in 1975. Notable alumni include Juwan Howard and Dick Butkus from that school. He married his high school sweetheart, Rhonda Gore. Ron? Rhonda Gore. Oh, Rhonda. On September 17, 1977. Together they had a daughter, Janice, born in 78. During his 20s and through his early 30s, he worked a variety of jobs, including janitor, coach, professional mover, cook, Mr. T. Driver, Wonder Bread, delivery man, furniture mover, and UPS agent. And he smoked cigarettes while peeling oranges, while doing comedy on the weekends at clubs and parties. Um, Bernard, Jeffrey, Bernie, Mac, Mac, Cullough. Bernie Mac. Oh, Bernie I love Mac. Bernie Mac. Yeah. Bernard Mac Cullo. Yeah, I love Bernie Mac. And he said his influences were from the Three Stooges and listening to stand-up comedians Richard Pryor and Red Fox. We should watch that show again. The Bernie Mac show. Yeah, that, that was, was funny. As funny hell. as hell. He's great. He's the best thing about uh, yeah, uh, uh, bad, bad Santa, Santa. I think. Yeah, him uh, and <laughs> him and John Ritter are the best. Oh, John about. Ritter's great in that too. Yeah, that's great. Anyway, uh, Bernie Mac started as a stand-up comedian in Chicago's Cotton Club after he won the Miller Lite Comedy Search at the age of thirty-two. His popularity as a comedian began to grow. Um, and <laughs> this is a funny little bit about Bernie Mac. Uh, A performance on HBO's Deaf Comedy Jam thrust him into the spotlight after Martin Lawrence was unable to calm an increasingly hostile crowd. Uh, The crowd was going nuts. He couldn't calm down. They couldn't do any more comedy. Then Mac went on stage and famously said, I ain't scared of you motherfuckers. Tell (laughs) tell the audience that he didn't come here for no foolishness. (laughs) That's awesome. Ah, Bernie Mac's the best. I knew you'd like that birthday. I did enjoy that one. Okay. October 10th, we're going to burn through these to get to your story. Okay. The Baseball World Series, the Braves beat the Yankees 5 to nothing at Yankee Stadium to clinch four games to three series victory. MVP was Braves pitcher Lou Burdett. And Brian McCartney's the only one who cares about that. October 10th, U.S. <laughs> Pres- President Eisenhower apologizes. This is awful. October 10th, President Eisenhower had to apologize to the finance minister of Ghana, uh, Komla Agbeli Bid- Bidema. I'm not sure if that's how you say that. I doubt it. Uh, he had apologized to him after he has refused service in a restaurant in Dover, Delaware. Obviously because he's black. black. October 14th, Everly Brothers single Wake Up Little Susie reaches number one. I love that song. Wake uh, up, little Susie, wake up. I knew you were going to sing it. And then October 20th, Walter. Movie wasn't so hot. <laughs> it didn't have much of a plot. It's five o'clock. Our goose is cooked. Our reputation is shot. Wake up, little Susie. All right, sorry. Walter Cronkite begins his weekly documentary. Yeah. And then on October 25th, Cosa Nostra crime boss Albert Anastasia is murdered in a barber's chair in New York City. Yeah. Probably by fellow mobster Joe Gallo. Ooh. Joe Gallo. I've never been like real interested in mob stuff. Yeah. I mean, I like the big mob movies. Like, Goodfellas is awesome, of course. And, you know, The Godfather is a good movie. And Sopranos. Those are all good. Yeah. And I love Sopranos. But but as far as, like, true crime mob stuff. Let me see if I can get you excited by telling this story. Okay. On the morning of October 25th, 1957, uh, Albert Anastasia entered the barbershop of the Park Sheridan Hotel at 56th Street and 7th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. Anastasia's driver parked the car in an underground garage and then took a walk outside, leaving him unprotected. As Anastasia relaxed in the barber's chair, two men with scarves covering their faces rushed in, shoved the barber out of the way, and fired at Anastasia. After the first volley of bullets, Anastasia reportedly lunged at his killers. However, the stunned Anastasia had actually attacked the gunman's reflections in the wall mirror of the barber shop. What? Yeah, he thought he was attacking them, but he was so groggy from getting shot. He was attacking the reflections. Oh, my God. The gunman continued firing until Anastasia finally fell dead on the floor. That was according to the New York Times. The Anastasia homicide generated a tremendous amount of public interest and sparked a high-profile police investigation. And according to the New York Times journalist and Five Families author Selwyn Rabb, who's written a book about this, uh, the vivid image of a helpless victim swathed in white towels and uh, was stamped in the public memory. That's according to his book Mm -hmm. in 2005 called The Five Families, The Rise, Decline, and Resurgence of America's Most Powerful Mafia Empires. However, no one was charged in the case. 
Oh. Speculation on who killed Anastasia has centered on Profacci, crime family mem- mobster, crazy Joe Gallo, the Patriarcha crime family of Providence, Rhode Island, and mm-hmm. certain drug dealers within the Gambino family. Initially, the NYPD concluded that Anastasia's ho- homicide has been arranged by Genovese and Gambino, and that it was carried out by a crew led by Gallo. Hmm. At one point, Gallo boasted to an associate of, of uh, an associate of his boasted to an associate of his about the hit. You can just call the five of us the barbershop quintet. Quintet, he said. Hmm. Elsewhere, Genovese had traditionally strong, strong ties to Patriarcha boss Raymond L. S. Patriarcha. Anyway, I think you're not as excited because these guys deal in crime, so they're they're the, criminals themselves. Yeah, they're, it's not so like it's a, not like an innocent an, an victim. Injustice. Like you, can't, you can't. Yeah, it's not an injustice, and you can't like put yourself in their shoes because you're not doing all this illegal stuff. You, yeah, you get fascinated. I think true crime people get fascinated with the the oh my god, it could happen to me. Yeah, I could be that victim. I can put my shoes and my feet in her shoes. That's or whatever, right. You know. Yeah. Which, I guess, is the thrill of it, or whatever. But I don't know. You like to be scared, and that brings us to October thirty first, nineteen. That is my date of birth. I got to the party and I did the Smurf. You know what the Smurf is? No. You do the Smurf? No. I think it's where you do like this kind of a thing. Oh God! Don't do that. I think that's kind of the Smurf. It is. He. It was. It looked like a. You were having a stroke. Well, I'm sitting in a. I'm not. You look like b- a Lane Bennis. Dancing. It kind of does. Like, uh, oh, it does. I would look like an idiot doing that dance. <laughs> yeah, you can't do the Smurf. No, I can do the Smurf, but you can't. Just kidding. I can't either. Um. Okay. And All now right. I'm ready to listen to your story. Tell me. I'm going to tell the sordid tale of the murder of Los Angeles hairstylist Peter Fabiano. Oh, is this one you've been so excited about? Tell, no, about? that one is going to be next w- time. And it's going to be it's very, it's gonna more be, exciting than this one? It's going to be perhaps, dare I say, the mo- the best one that I've ever had to cover. Really? Next next time. This time, though, is pretty good. This okay. time is pretty good. All right, this one's so going to be great. We're Halloween night, right? Let me just check my email. Stop real quick. it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. All right. The, uh, Halloween night my, of 1957. My main sources were, oh, yeah. one was the uh, a website called The Vintage Woman Magazine, which is now my new favorite website. Cause the Vintage Woman Magazine? That is for you. I know it. Is it about true crime and dressing vintage? Um, It's about all things vintage. So there's... So crime. Crime counts. is in there. And then the truecrimeedition.com was the other one. Crimeedition.com. Okay. All right. So we're Halloween night, 1957, um, 11 o'clock that night. Yep. Uh, so after all, most of the trick-or-treating is done. That's correct. Peter Fabiano was at home with his wife, okay. Betty, and they were already in bed. Oh. And they hear the ding-dong of the doorbell. Ding-dong. The ding-dong, ding-dong. And so... He gets up and he's thinking, "Oh, well, this is late for there's fucking no, trick or treating." There's no more goddamn candy. But he left. grabs the, you know, he's got some, oh, so he's he like, "All right, well, fuck." So he grabs the bowl, and he goes to the door oh and he op- opens the door. Yeah. And, um, the trick or treater, shall we say, who was there, was taller than most of the previous revelers, and he had an odd appearance, okay. even by Halloween standards. Uh. It was reported that he had a grotesque, garishly painted face with a domino mask and men's clothing, blue yeah. jeans, a khaki jacket, and red gloves. It's a domino mask. Yeah, with a domino mask. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, holding up a paper bag that concealed a gun, the disguised stranger answered the homeowner's query in a deceptively deep voice. Oh, oh a domino mask is what they call. Oh, it's like a, a like, like low the Lone Ranger, Ranger type mask. mask. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting to know. All right. So back up a little bit to the domino mask, because I... So... Domino um, mask. So he's dressed like men's clothes. Yep. Holding up a paper bag. Inside yep. it is a gun. The homeowner says, no, in a deep voice. And then... The homeowner said that? Not the homeowner. The the guy. The, the person. The guy who's there at the door in the mask. Yes. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, Betty hears a loud pop. And then she it wakes her up and her daughter Judy up. 
Oh, Judy's the daughter. So she runs to the front door and she finds Peter shot, oh, bleeding no. out in this pool of his own blood. Ugh. So she, she's got a neighbor who's a, a cop. So she okay. runs over there and they call the Valley Police Department. Okay. So then they take him to Sun Valley Hospital where he's pronounced dead from the gunshot in his chest. Oh my gosh. But they don't see the intruder anymore. Right. So the only witness to the shooting was a teenager who saw a car speeding away from the neighborhood. Really? There were no gun shells left at the scene, and nothing had been taken from the house, despite the family owning two successful hair and beauty shops. Oh, you would think if you were knocking on the door of yep. the owners of a successful hair and beauty shop and you're going to shoot them, that your motive would be robbery. You would think. So um, It the shooting had the characteristics of a gang hit, but oh. the only record the hairstylist had was for a charge of bookmaking in 1948. And I don't know what that bookmaking would be. It's the, probably something with book, like cooking the books. You, the only motive that they had was No, the only record. He had a record. But it was for bookmaking. Bookmakers make money by charging a fee on their customers' bets. Oh, not, okay. Not placing wagers themselves. Yeah, okay. So they're just handling bets and charging a fee. Yeah. So that's not a big deal. So he had no connection to any crime syndicate, and the lead, and so that lead went away. Uh, so let's kind of go back a little bit. Peter and Betty right. met in the forties. Yeah. Betty was already divorced from her first husband and was a single mother of two. Aww. They began their marriage in New York and had moved to Los Angeles the year before Peter's death. Okay. So when Betty told police her account of Halloween night, she explained that she thought there were two people at the front door. Two, two men with one pretending to be a woman. And then when asked if Peter had any enemies, she gave them one name, Joan Rabble. Okay, did she say why she thought there was two people? She just, what she heard? I think she heard voices. Really? Joan Rabble? Joan Rabble. Joan Rabble was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1917. She had a lucrative career as a writer and a photographer selling or sailing around the Americas. Ooh. In 1957, she gets to Peter Fabiano's salon. She uh -huh. wants some work after her divorce. Okay, so she was wanting them to hire her as a stylist of some sort. And so, well, they hire her on as like the desk girl or whatever. Oh, okay. Desk so her, woman. So desk woman. Please. Joan and Betty become really good friends. Betty Fabiano. Yes. Okay. And Joan was welcomed into the Fabiano family. Oh. It was like she was family. She was like a family friend. So then Peter and Betty started having marriage problems. Uh-oh. And, and when that happened, Betty moved in with Joan while that was oh, going Betty on. Betty moved in with Joan. So Peter started getting threatened by how close they they these two women were. No, he didn't like it. And in the newspapers of the time they described the relationship as quote unquote abnormal oh really which is code for gay so yeah because you're not allowed to right. be a lesbian in this day and age so that is what i think is so it, so that's why betty is saying that joan might have a motive right right so then betty eventually decides that her marriage to peter's worth saving okay and she tells Peter about the affair she's been having with Joan. Oh, okay. The couple then get back together, and Betty agrees she won't see Joan anymore. So that same year that all that's going on, right? On some level, Peter's probably like, awesome. No, stop. No, so you don't that, think? that same year, yeah. 1957, maybe he is. I don't know. Oh, yeah, who um, knows? Who, we, we'll never know. We'll never know because he's The problem is we'll never know what he's into. That's right. But don't kink shame him. Some people not. are into that. Of course not. So while that's all going on that same year. Don't kink shame me. All right, listen. Sorry. sorry. Okay. Back Joan, to the story. Joan had met this woman named Goldine Pizer, who was a medical secretary. Wait, Goldine Pizer? Yes. No. Yes. Joan. Okay, when did Joan meet Goldie Pyle? The same year, oh, I'm okay. telling you. Okay, right, but before his death. Right. The same year that all that was going on. Okay. Where Be yes, before well, his death. Now you have to tell me how to spell Goldine Pizer because I got to put it in the tags. G O L D, like gold. Yeah. Y N E. Oh, Y N E. So and I then Pizer is just P I Z E R. So it might be Goldine Pizer. I think it's Goldine. Okay. 
I believe you, Goldine Pizer. That's a great name. I know it. So Joan and Goldine become fast friends. <laughs> Goldine Pizer. And they spend their free time together talking and gossiping. Joan and Goldine do. Joan okay. and Goldine do. But does Goldine Goldine doesn't work at the salon? No. Right? She's just a friend. She's of just a medical secretary. Oh, okay. So then it's reported that Goldine was also gay. And had okay. spent her life suppressing her feelings and had married Herbert Crome, a naval pharmacist, who Herbert she had Crome? recently divorced. These are the best names ever. Uh, Herbert Crome. All right. So it was during these coffee mornings with Joan and Goldine together, sitting there having coffee, bullshitting. Yeah. Um, that Joan started telling Goldine how evil Peter Fabiano was. Then, And Joan said... That she she told Goldine that she was heartbroken and she was so angry that Betty went back to Peter, and she wanted revenge on him. Okay. So Joan began to seduce Goldine, as she had Betty, and eventually convinced Goldine to kill Peter for her. Oh wow! So Goldine wow. Had so said, she so gold so she Goldine's a victim in this, but yeah, also she, a potentially murderer. She says, she was, Goldine was quoted as saying, I had no motive personally. Whatever motive I had was to please Joan. I was always easily influenced. I have been impressionable and always trusting. Wow. So she bought, Goldine bought a 38 Smith & Wesson from a shop in Pasadena under the guise of wanting the weapon for personal protection. Wow. So then she waited outside Fabiano's home on Halloween night in a uh-huh. car Joan borrowed from a friend. Okay. They waited until all the lights in the house went out. Then Goldine approached the home in a superhero eye mask and committed oh. the murder. So does that... Does does the person that Joan borrowed the car, mm-hmm. Joan borrowed the car, gave it to Goldine to go do this, right. does the person that Joan borrowed the car become an, uh, an accomplice then? Um, probably crime? not back Probably not back then, but now there is something called felony murder, and that basically says that even if somebody, um, if you lent somebody your car and then they go and murder somebody, murder somebody you can be charged with murder. Really? Yes. Even if I don't know that they're going to go yes. plan on murdering? Yes. So and there's lesson- not all states have that law, though. Florida's a notorious one. So lesson is, they do have that law or they don't? They do. So lesson is, don't let anybody borrow your car for anything. Well, and it could be anything. If you're gone, if you had a gun and you borrow, you lent somebody your gun, or if well, you were... I don't were, have a gun. Um, God, there was... Now I can't remember. Are you saying like if our if our son says, "Hey, can I borrow the car?" I'm going on a date and going bowling with my lady. I'm like, "Yeah, you can borrow the car. Here's the keys, son." And it's not his car, but he's borrowing my car. And then he goes, he gets, an, he gets in an altercation with somebody at the bowling alley, uh, Teen Wolf style, and like throws a bowling ball at them yeah. and kills them. I can be accomplice because he drove there in my car. Maybe. Or does he have to be in the car and commit the murder at the time? I don't know. I'm not sure. All yeah. right. So Goldine disposed of the gun in a storage locker in a Los Angeles branch of Bullock Department Store. Okay. And um, an anonymous tip led detectives to the weapon and in turn to Goldine Pizer's door two weeks later. Ooh. She was arrested in her Hollywood home where she took told the police, it's a relief to get it off my mind. An anonymous tip turned her in, huh? Joan was eventually arrested, and the two women went through several examinations with psychiatrists as the court believed that homosexuality may have made them unfit to stand trial. Can you believe that? You're not thinking straight because you've... Because you're gay. Gay. Jeez. One of the psychiatrists wrote about Goldine. The only thought she had was that she had saved her friend Joan Rabble from an evil person. Both women pleaded not guilty, but eventually changed their plea. Pizer pleaded insanity and claimed she was just easily influenced. Yeah. Joan refused to comment throughout the hearing, so she just didn't say anything. Why do? And I, she just she just sat there with this weird smile on her face during that's the whole insanity. trial. That's insanity, don't you think? Yes. A so, weird smile like that, and and I have the I I guess I don't understand the insanity plea in general. Because wouldn't you have to be insane to kill someone? Like, just everyone's insane. Like, no, anybody because killing someone, you're the, insane. The legal definition of insanity is that you didn't know what you were doing was wrong at the time of you your were, actions. You were in such an agitated state. You didn't know what you, you were doing was right wrong. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't make any uh, moves to cover it up. 
afterwards because okay. that would show that you knew what you had done was wrong. Oh, that's like malicious intent. Right, or right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, but generally, you'd have to be insane to even do all that malicious intent. Well, like, some people are just, some people have anger issues that, like, which is rage. insanity. That's insanity, yeah. right? All right. Isn't that insanity? I don't, I don't know. know. Okay. So they were both eventually charged with second degree murder and were sentenced okay. to five years to life. Five years to life. That's, so that's weird. That's, yeah. Goldine Pizer was released and stayed in Los Angeles. She died really? in 1998 when she was 83. What? There's, After killing a man? Yep. There's little information about Joan Rabble, but it's assumed that she was released from prison around the same time as Goldine. Wow. Betty Fabiano sold the beauty businesses. It's unknown if she had a hand in her husband's death. Wow. One website without evidence claims that Betty and Joan were lovers and that Betty engineered the murder plot after complaining that Peter was abusive. This is unsubstantiated, as right. are the allegations of abuse, but it reveals the depth of mystery that lingers around this case. Betty appears to have remarried in 1966, and she passed away in 1999 at the age of 81, which made her 39 at the time of Pete's death, not 36, as most believed her to be. Poor Goldie Pizer. I think she's and then this little quote at the end said, No and Joan? No one knows what happened to Joan. She seems to have disappeared into thin air like a ghost, a badly dressed ghost bent on wreaking Halloween terror. Oh, because man. Look they at took, the picture of them. Because they talked about, in that Vintage Woman's magazine, Yeah, they talked about how dumpy Joan was all the time and about how she well, grabbed, she was dressed and everything. Well, I was just looking at the, There's a picture of them both. Yeah. Um, I think that's uh, probably Betty. Betty. Betty's kind of pretty. Yeah. but And Goldine's kind of cute. Yeah. But Joan, but Joan is not attractive. Is not super hot, but Joan I mean, is. But Goldine, kind of, I was picturing Goldine as being kind of like a, like I don't know, an older lady with rollers in her hair, or whatever. I don't know why, but she's kind of cute. I mean, he, as I can tell from his grainy newspaper picture, but right, right, poor thing. So that's I the story of Goldine. Peter Fabiano's Halloween murder. What do you think a woman's jail would be like in, in the fifties? Probably not that bad. Although all there's my, probably a bunch of prison um, knowledge comes racists from, in there, though. Yeah, yeah, probably. All my pre- be dangerous my, as hell. All my women's prison knowledge comes from Orange the New Black. <laughs> I know, me too. And so I, I don't know if that's accurate at all. I don't think it is. Probably not. <laughs> it was in the 50s. Who knows? It might be. But until they broke my heart, but and I stopped watching because they broke my heart when they murdered. Um, what was her name? Who did they murder? Remember? Uh uh-uh. uh The um the. I don't remember anything. I know that, but do they the separate one that, by the race? Gay, the gay one with the short hair, and she couldn't breathe, and they were leaned on her, and they killed her. I don't she was, that. Um, she was the girlfriend of... Um, oh, the guards killed her? Yes. They leaned on her, and she couldn't breathe, and she was like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, until they killed her. It was so I horrible to, to watch. And that was before that. George Floyd. I don't even remember that. So, uh, but I don't remember much. I, I don't remember anything, man. I, my memory's getting worse and worse. I'm, I don't know how much longer I'll be around. Everybody, sorry. Mine is really bad too. Like yeah. I'm gonna be in a. We're, we're gonna home. both be blithering idiots. Yeah, our kid, our poor kids. Our All right. Like I, there's stuff. What? Yeah, I have conversations. A week later, I don't remember it. I'm the same way. Really? Yes. It's getting old, I think, maybe. We're getting old. We should probably do some memory exercises. I don't think those work. I, th- I read somewhere that they it's a bunch it's of bullshit. It's all bullshit? Yeah. Like, it's good to think critically and, you know, do that kind of thing, but those things that are like brain games and those, some somewhere I read something that said those are... I feel like since the pandemic, real. I've been even more spacey. You like, me too. I think that's something, so... Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. We apologize. <laughs> Here's for... our medical issues. Thank you for listening. Yeah, we have a lot of issues. Uh, we'll be both be dead soon. Thanks for listening. Rate and review. Subscribe. Send us lots of cash. What's your cash app? Stop. Time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. All right. We love you. Thanks for listening.
Matt Truman Ego Trip is the greatest band of all time. Buy their music.